There it is. Hello, my name is Victoria Perkovic Gutierrez, and I work at the city of Malmo with urban, well, city planning, and uh, primarily with Million Programmen, uh, the Million House building stock here. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the Million Program is, is that in Sweden, 1963, I think it was, we, our government took a decision. We were lacking a lot of houses, so they said, let's build one million apartments. Uh, they did it during 10 years, and now 650,000 of them are eight or three floor buildings, so multi residential housing. Um, I was asked to talk about how we work here in Malmo, and I've been doing that for a couple of years. And um, working with that, specifically when you work with new methods, you're often invited to, to give speeches like this. And uh, yesterday I was in Brussels telling um, uh, the commission, the EU commission, of how we work with democracy aspects here in Malmo. And every time we start our presentations as a city, or most of the times, we start by presenting how good we are. So all cities that presented yesterday were telling how fantastic they were, all the prizes they're winning, how they are the best city to bicycle in, or the most environmental friendly city. Um, and that's, I can understand it, because there's a huge trend. The competition between cities and urban areas is huge. I was going to start like that too, telling the nice story of Malmö, the transition of Malmö. I often do that, but then I decided that I actually I'm not. Um, I'm uh, working for a couple of more weeks and then I'm off to South America. So I'm taking these last weeks to preach instead of the lessons I learned. Um, so if you want the methods that we have used, if you want to see the tour, I brought all material with me and you're more than able to catch me uh, afterwards and ask me about the processes. But I'm not going to talk about the specific process because I, I, you're going to have people that know more about processes than I do. Uh, I'm going to talk about the city, I'm going to talk about power, and I'm going to talk about equality because I think those are much more important issues to talk about when we talk about urban development. Um, the background as to why we, I've been working with these issues is that in Malmo we have huge differences social differences. It depending on where in the city you actually grew up, it depends, you can, uh, your expected life uh, age, the expected, you are going to, it's uh, seven years. So if you grew up in Rosengård or Kruksbeck, you're supposed to live seven years less than if you grew up on the other side of the street. And actually, it's just one street. And then you can ask yourself, is it the buildings who actually make this year in, in difference? I don't believe that. At the same time, that we as a city are facing huge social challenges. And for those of you who hasn't visited the central station of Malmö right now, you can do it. I actually, uh, as much as I said, go and visit Rosengård and what we do there. I say go to the central station, but that's where things are happening right now. We have thousands of persons coming each day to the city. So what happens all around the world actually uh, happens here too. We have the environmental aspect. Last year we had one day of rain that cost us as a city 160, 160 million Swedish crowns in one day. There was one rain. And that's not included what it costs to all individuals. So the environmental is important. What happens, the political issues all around the world is important. And we are a city competing with other cities, but we are also a city in the world. So what happens in the world is going to affect us a lot. We also are a city in urgent need for housing. And one of the main reasons is that we cannot expand outside the city um, wh where our arable land is. We have one of the best soils to, to grow food on. And we just keep building outside the city border, which many people say, uh, we're actually going to face other problems that how are we going to feed people. So we cannot just continue uh, building things everywhere. We have to be aware of nature and we have to take aspects of political issues happening around the world. 
and that's where, where I work. That's my context. I work with urban development in a city, mainly with the Million program. People in these areas are the one who are in quite the, the, the school results, the housing, everything is quite it's not so good as other parts of the city. And this was the reason I didn't want to start with the success story of Malmö. Because the success story of Malmö, you always get told. And these areas you of are often forgotten. But they still exist. And we actually see that even though Malmö is growing as a city, is expanding, our GDP is increasing, the segregation is growing. Which means that we have areas in the city that are not catching up to this growth in the city. Urban planning is there and urban development is therefore not a, a random process. Westerhamnen and Hilje is not a thing that just happened for itself. It's urban planning, urban development, how we build our cities and why we build our cities that way. It's a political process. It's a planning process and it's made, it's a result of goals that the city puts. So if we say that the city is going to develop in such way, the city is going to develop that way. And one of the things that I've seen is that the power aspect <laughs> is often forgotten. We decide that we want to build certain things and at the same time with the limited economy that we have, we actually say no to other parts of the development. Another aspect is the land issue. Who owns the land? And uh, I believe that we're going to get closer to... Up, um, as the city develops, the, the ownership of the land is going to get more and more important. We have seen that in other countries where the ownership is uh, becoming more and more important. And we don't have that thought here in Sweden yet. Since urban development is a political issue, there's a conflict in it. Uh, a conflict of interests of how do you want to develop your city and for who is the city for, the city that you want to create. Um, and it's a huge conflict about, uh, between those who have power and those who lack power. And I'm going to get back to that, how we've been working. But remember, I'm not going to give all specific details. You can read them yourself. Uh, so if we see that there are conflicts in the city and everything is a political, uh, and urban planning is a lot of a political issue, we have to be aware. A lot of people say, but we all want the same. We all want a good city. I actually believe that this neutral post-political consensus that we always say that we have is a lie. I don't believe that we can have consensus regarding the cities. I believe that we need to be very specific for who we build our cities and why. And if Malmö is going to build a city for all inhabitants, we have to start thinking and changing our innovation from Western Harbour and Hilje to the other areas. And this comes to my to, to another thing that I would like to talk to you is democracy. Uh, and before we talk about democracy, we need to discuss the term exclusion. Uh, in the political area right now, we're always talking about the excluded people. We need to include people more. And there has been a shift regarding who is included. And right now, we talk about excluded people as people who don't have jobs. If you look at the debate on the news, it's about, uh, in Swedish, it's uh, utanförskap. Människor i utanförskap. I believe that uh, exclusion is more of a psycho uh, psychological sense of belonging to a city, to be take a part of a city, a uh, mutual ownership of the city. And uh, the problem that I have with this shift with regarding this as uh, with regarding the exclusion is that we talk about exclusion and say that by specific uh, by in uh, working with such uh, very specific measures we can take excluded people and make them 
included. By giving someone a job, they could come from being excluded to being included. I don't believe that. In most of the areas where I work, lots of people have jobs, but they're not included in society. We need to start thinking about who we are to include and why we're going to include them. Who is it that we actually are talking about? And what is it that we want to include them to? Uh, is it the Swedish normal, what, what uh, we call um, the, the mainstream Swedish society of uh, herring and drinking schnapps? Or is it that our society actually has changed and we need to start including other people? I work with the Million Program areas in Malmö and according to me, they are not the most segregated areas in the city. The most segregated areas in the city is Limham. Because in Limham, 93%, I think it was, voted last year. All children, uh, or most of children, leave school with grades to uh, continue studying. The parents come from a socio-economical background that is really good. And then we need to start, is, is, are they the ones who are going to be included? When I often talk, everyone is saying, oh, these are the people in the million programs that need to be included in society. Hmm? Of course, but we have other people that need to be included. From a city perspective, we have planning processes that says, say to us how we're going to, to build the cities and how we're going to involve the cities. Uh, it's really nice said and it says in all, um, it's really defined. And uh, on the other hand, oh, on the other side, also we have a democracy. Everyone can go and vote. But if we have areas in the city where only 25% of the people vote, how can this democratic process, is that even work? Uh, another aspect is that in, in the 50s, there were five people to each politician. The politicians, they're the ones sitting up there. Uh, nowadays, we have 250 people on each politician here in Malmo which means that the gap between the, the people and the politicians are growing much more. So we need to take count these things in when we say who we invite, because it says in our regulation that we need to take people into the processes, but I'm not sure that we actually do. And then it's the, we come to the next slide, that I was, who, when we actually do turn to the, uh, our, to the people and ask, what is it that you, we want? What is it that you want? How do we want to, what is it that you, we're going to develop this area? Who do you think turns up? Gender, representation and participation are three aspects that are actually so linked to this. Every time we have some kind of dialogue, um, most people turning up, are men. Most people that turn up are ethnically Swedish men. And most of and they are above 50 years old. Because they are the ones who know that they can speak and that the politicians will listen. We've been working a lot on changing that. Because if we see that it's 50 year old Swedish men taking part in the planning of the city. The city that we actually are creating is not for everyone. Gender representation and participation are really difficult things to talk about. Um, people often get... It, it's hard to talk about things that aren't so... Com that it's not comfortable. Because this means that we actually have failed. We are excluded. A lot of people, and the example that I was going to give you in a cup, just a couple of minutes, is uh, Rosenstrada Matta, and we've done that in several parts now. I don't know if you visited it, and if you're going to stay in Malmo for a couple of days, please go. It's just two and one and a half kilometers from here. Um, it's a public space that used to be a parking, and, uh, and it's in the middle of a million program area. And when we were going to build it, we said, "Oh, we never have kids." The young people, they, they, their vote never gets counted. So even though we invited a lot of people, we, we, we knew, we had a feeling that this didn't work. So we said, um, let's do an activity area because that's what the kids want. They want sports. 
we started painting that and uh, I talking to my colleagues. And then a very smart uh, person from the academia said, you know that 80% of the activity areas like this are used by boys, not girls. So w even when we try to do our best, we really thought that we were doing a really good thing. We actually are failing because we are excluding people. So we took a whole new view in this and we started from the beginning and we said let's exclude everyone that we know actually is taking part in the process uh, before has any gone let's start by excluding to include new persons we've been working with Rosenstrada Matta for a couple of years uh, it's done and the process has been quite amazing uh, I know it's been a lot of critics because we excluded a lot of people. We said that you're not welcome to take part of this process. This process is going to be for these. And it was quite a small group who we invited. And here it comes. The process and the partnership needs to be broadened when we talk about urban development. What we did here is that we had a new kind of partnership where we invited girls um, of a certain age. We invited totally new, uh, we started to work with the movements in the area, not with individuals, but with specific organizations. And we started to design a process where we, as the city, gave over the power to someone else. And uh, it's quite easy for me to say, I'm 34. Uh, if you are 55 and man and work as my boss, it's quite more difficult to say we're going to invest 10 million Swedish crowns and we're going to just give them away and someone else is going to decide. And me and Magdalena have been talking about this before. The results, I can have some, uh, I have some several questions about it, but the process was the most important how we, for one of the first times, actually gave over the power to someone else. Uh, how, who we invite and uh, what knowledge we count, I believe is quite impro uh, important. And this is the partnership. We used to believe that the architects or the landscape architects are the one with the knowledge. I think we need to broaden what knowledge is because this 17 year old girls had much more knowledge about this area than any landscape architect that I ever met. And the question that I had to the landscape architects was, how can it be in a city where 30% of our inhabitants actually come from areas like this, that in our city hall, no one from these areas work. How is it possible that we have none landscape architect being born and raised in one of these areas? I believe that we also need to start broadening who we work, not only in the city, but who, how we work with them. Uh, you were talking about uh, the knowledge aspect. I, I have no idea how this... Is it... What, what look at Thanks. Um, who we work with and why we work them, but also the knowledge aspect. We need to broaden the aspect of what knowledge is and take account of other parts. But all of you need to take count, take to take a responsibility of thinking who works in your organizations. If you're going to have, and you really mean that you want to, others to be part of the processes of the, how do you design the city, you actually need to take account who do you recruit. And gender and uh, ethnicity actually matters. I still think it's crazy that we have no one from these areas working in here in Malmö. Um, I need to speed up. I still believe that there's a huge conflict of interest in the whole planning process. Who has the power? The people living in these areas don't have the power. Who has the knowledge? Well, they have knowledge, but it's knowledge that actually doesn't count. And many of our organizations don't take that to account. And then as a city, I can say that we need to start working in totally new ways. We need to let go 
of the power. And with power comes money. We need to let go of our money and give the money to people that actually can work in the areas. I think that we need totally new methods of how we work in the areas that we cannot have plans for the whole city and the urban development of the whole city as we used to have. And that's actually a question of leadership and innovation. We need innovative methods, but we need innovative um, leadership. And to that it takes courage. And I hope all of you here take this to you, have the courage to start questioning how your organizations actually work. Who has the power and what knowledge do you actually count? Thank you so much.